Morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Good. Um, thanks, Danny. Um, welcome, everyone, to UX Brighton. There's a hashtag. You may have spotted it. Um, as Danny said, I'm Richard Rutter. I'm one of the co-founders of Clear Left. Uh, we're a user-centered design agency based here in Brighton. And just to give you a little context about Clear Left, uh, we're about 25 people um, comprising researchers, project managers, strategists, front-end developers, visual designers, UX designers, um, of which I am one. And uh, we've worked over the last 11 years for loads of different organizations, different sizes from huge ones like councils and banks and publishing houses. We recently redesigned the site for Penguin Books through to tiny startups and, and local charities. And we used to call ourselves a UX agency, um, but you may have noticed I said user-centered design studio. Um, and we were one of the first self-described UX agencies in the UK, I would say. Pro maybe not the first, but one of the first. Um, but like I said, we don't describe ourselves as that anymore, and, and I wonder why that is. The UX is dead. Well, it's not, is it? That's a lie. Um, long live UX. UX is dead, long live UX. This is, that's the, uh, the theme of the conference today. Um, but what is UX anyway? You know, or rather, what was it and what has it become? Here's a man who has good claim to coining the phrase in the first place back in the 90s. And here's what he thinks UX is supposed to mean and what he thinks has happened to it. Once upon a time, a very long time ago, I was at Apple. And you know, we said, the experience of using these computers is weak. Uh, the experience, when you first discover it, when you see it in the store, when you buy it, when you, ooh, can't fit it into the car, it's in this great big box, it doesn't fit into the car. And when you finally do get it home, you're opening the box up and, oh, it looks scary, I don't know if I dare put this computer together. All of that is user experience. It's everything that touches upon your experience with the product, and it may not even be near the product, it may be when you're telling somebody else about it. That's what we meant when we devised the term user experience and set up what we call the user experience architects office at Apple to try to enhance things. Now Apple was already pretty good, so we were starting with a good product, making it even better. Today that term has been horribly misused. It's used by people to say, I'm a user experience designer, I design websites or I design apps, and they have no clues to what they're doing, and they think the experience is that simple device, the website or the app or who knows what. No, it's everything. It's the way you experience the world, it's the way you experience your life, it's the way you experience the service. Or, yeah, an app or a, or a computer system but it's a system, it's everything. Got it? Got it? Well, that was one way to appear on the stage with Don Norman anyway. Um, so UX is about the, the user's experience of the system, whatever that might be. But has UX lost its way? Um, when Danny invited us all here, um, his provocation was, has UX become a thing designers do rather than a thing users have? And it's an interesting question. Um, and perhaps our young profession, that of user experience design for the digital realm, um, has reached some kind of existential crisis. Maybe we'll find out by the end of the day. Um, but we wouldn't be alone. Visual designers have been scratching their heads in a similar way. We see these kinds of quotes happening around. Um, have today's designers stopped dreaming? Um, has uh, web design lost its soul? Um, so is UX just a thing we do now? Have we got it nailed? Can we just look at the manual, follow a checklist and call it done, um, and then do exactly the same thing on the next job, and the next job, and the one after that? Danny's provocation got me thinking, if we do UX, what is it that we actually do? And if you ask Google that question, one of the results you get back is this from the UXPA, the User Experience Designers Pro 
User Experience Professionals Association, something like that. Um, and, uh, and it shows that we kind of struggle what, um, to describe what we do, but we normally end up putting ourselves in the center of the world. Um, there we are, a nice blurry graphic for you with us in the center of the world, and this happens a lot. Um, and a lot. <laughs> and a lot. And a lot. Yep. Still the center of the world, everything feeding into us. There we are, and that's how you do it. Um, <laughs> and that is my favorite visualization of them all. <laughs> The UX horse, which, of course, we all know is actually a unicorn. <laughs> so if the UXPA is right, and we are fed by all of these disciplines, then we've got a huge pond of knowledge to fish in. And that pond is only going to get bigger, and it's going to get smarter and more complex fish. Um, and, and us people, we people who do UX, we're going to need to keep evolving if we're to keep up with everything that feeds us. And, and that's what I'm going to talk a bit about today. And when I say we should be evolving, I'm simply talking about getting better at our jobs, but all the time. And one of the best ways to do that, apart from to practice what we do, um, is to look around us and take on what we see as good. And we've been doing that for ages. Um, take wireframes, for example. That's a wireframe. The original sort of idea of a wireframe. It's, uh, it mocks up the form of an artwork and, and is the foundation upon which the piece is built. In this case, a topiary sculpture. In his collection of essays on poetry and literary criticism called The Sacred Wood, um, T.S. Eliot wrote... Immature poets imitate, mature poets steal. Now, you might be more familiar with good artists copy, great artists steal, supposedly said by Picasso, but that would actually be our first Steve Jobs quote of the day um, because he popularized that misappropriation um, in an interview about 20 years ago. Picasso didn't say that, or there's no evidence that he did, but what Picasso did say is, when there's anything to steal, I steal. Um, and more interestingly, when he's speaking about the work of uh, one of his contemporaries, he says, you've got to be able to picture side by side everything Matisse and I were doing at that time. No one has ever looked at Matisse's painting more carefully than I, and no one has looked at mine more carefully than he. So he's talking about basically seeing what Matisse is doing and, and picking the best stuff that Matisse has done and using it for himself. And this is the difference between copying and stealing in this case. And it's not one of intellectual property. It's about taking someone else... It's not about taking someone else's idea and pretending that it was yours. If you copy someone else's technique or method without thinking, you'll be using something that worked for them in their circumstances. But by stealing a technique, you're making it your own. You'll have to work out why it works for them, how it can work for you, and adapting and moulding that technique is necessary, maybe completely changing the context in which you use it. One good example is the design game that um, we sort of that we that we play at Clear Left. It's called Fuzzy Edges. Fluffy Edges, actually, is the official term. Fluffy Edges. And we stole it from Agile's planning poker. Now, planning poker, as many of you may know, is a consensus-based estimating technique where a project team um, estimates how long a given story is going to take to do. And the idea is that a team discusses the feature amongst themselves, and then all at the same time, they vote with these cards to say it's going to take three points or three days or whatever the unit is. And if not everyone agrees, then that process is repeated more discussion ensues until everyone, the consensus is, yes, that feature will take three days to do. Now, Fluffy Edges takes the same idea, but for role mapping, we have a list of roles and jobs that needs to be done for a project, and we go through them one by one, and instead of holding up numbers, we hold up people's names, and there's a consensus amongst the team, amongst the project team, of who is going to do that role. 
and be responsible and own that role for the rest of the project. And we do this with our client. This is one of the outputs from a client. Um, and, but we also do it as an internal team. And that's where it really comes into its own. Uh, we ask about the roles that normally fall between the cracks. Um, and where there are sort of fluffy edges around the roles and ownership. So for example, we'll say, who is responsible for asking the client if we can use their name in some publicity? Who is responsible for organizing a revisit of the work, maybe six months after post-launch? Who is responsible for the learning on the project? And that last one is quite key. Um, we always assign someone to be responsible for that, to be responsible for making sure that upfront we work out or have a guess at what can we learn from this new project as individuals and collectively. And for checking back again at the end of the project, what did we learn? Did we learn that stuff? Were there different things that we learned? And it's a way of identifying something to try out on a project. And, and using that mindset, it's like I've got these ideas, these things that I wanted to use. Um, and when you look at a project that's going to be coming out in front of you for the next 12 months, picking out what you could be doing. <coughs> and so at the end of the project, the person who's responsible for the learning um, or ensuring that learning is, uh, is sort of delegated to see if it panned out um, is also responsible for making sure that that learning is disseminated to the rest of the team and the rest of the company. And we do that in a number of ways. Each discipline team... Um, so that would be the visual designers or the front-end developers or the UX designers, um, project managers and so on. Gets together once a week um, for an hour basically to talk shop. We'll talk about, maybe do a round-the-room design review. We'll talk through a problem. Um, we'll discuss a new tool. Whatever we want to, really. It's just a way to get people who are doing the same kind of job together um, to talk shop. Um, but those sessions are open to everyone. So... Um, it's perfectly acceptable and expected, really, for a front-end developer to come to um, the UX get-together. Um, and so quite often, there'll be a mix of disciplines in the room. Um, and part of what that does is enables a mutual respect throughout the company. If a front-end developer thinks a piece of functionality is going to be hard to use, then it's completely expected and appreciated that they will say so and suggest an alternative. And in fact, being front-end developers, what they're more likely to do is not just suggest an alternative, but build a prototype to show you how it should be done. Because um, those are the kind of can-do guys developers can be. The other thing we do is have a brown bag lunch um, or a brown bag beer on the beach, where the whole company is invited to hear a short presentation from any of us um, about something they want to share. It might be a summary of a project that we've just finished or some new techniques to share. A great example recently was a talk from Charlotte, one of our developers, um, on what can be now can be done easily in CSS that couldn't be done a few years ago, so that the designers don't feel hamstrung. Um, they can actually come up with stuff, and the developers will be able to do it quite happily without pushing back. Another thing we're introducing soon is a monthly um, innovation breakfast, which is such a wanky name, it'll probably end up being used. Um, the, the idea is to celebrate and disseminate the new things that we inevitably devise um, when we're working on projects. Each project team is, will spend like no more than 10 minutes just telling the rest of us about some stuff that they've worked out new during the previous month. And it might be trying a new piece of software or framework or a different kind of sketching workshop a tweaked way to get agile into the design process, anything that we've never quite done before at Clear Left. Um, other people might have done it in other companies, that's fine, but we may not have done that, and so we want to learn from those things. And it's good for sort of the soul in as much as it makes you remember that you are developing all the time. All the time you have to think and work out how to do something, that's something new in your repertoire. As I said, these little innovations are, in, are inevitable, and there's a good reason for that. When we started ClearLeft in 2005, web design as a profession was well established. It already had had a bubble and burst it. Um, and even so, like everyone else, we were making it up as we were going along, and we still are, and we're proud of that. 
um, is how we go about our work. It's built right into our values. In particular, own it and be fleet of foot. Own it is about the autonomy, being empowered to make independent decisions. Be fleet of foot is about being flexible and nimble and adaptable. And we put those meetings in place, those ones I was just mentioning, um, because we've chosen an exciting profession to work in, all of us have. Things are always changing. There's always new stuff to learn um, and improve upon. Um, and if we grab the opportunity to do so, we'll be happier for it. It turns out there are three factors that the science shows lead to better performance, um, not to mention personal satisfaction. <laughs> Autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Right, let's talk about mastery. Mastery is our urge to get better at stuff. We like to get better at stuff. This is why people play musical instruments on the weekend. you got all these people who are acting in ways that seem irrational economically. They play musical instruments on weekends? Why? It's not going to get them a mate. It's not going to make them any money. Why are they doing it? Because it's fun, because you get better at it, and that's satisfying. That was Daniel Pink on, on why we do what we do, um, because it's fun and satisfying, right? Well, that's the idea. Um, our job, as I see it, as UX designers, is to uncover problems, reveal needs, find solutions, and hone experiences. But most importantly, it's to communicate all of those things. Problems are only solved if you can. Um, problems are only solved when solutions are communicated in such a way that they're acted upon. And your focus as a UX designer um, should be to make your client or your boss look good and help them communicate your solution onwards. And sometimes that needs a little bit of lateral thinking. Recently, Clearleft um, did some work for a high-end fashion brand. Uh, we needed a way to understand and communicate the vision they had for the work that we were being asked to do. Um, it wasn't clear that there was alignment there. And one of the first things we did was visit their flagship store in London. It's an amazing space, and it gave us a real sense of what the brand is all about um, and what we needed to bring to their digital presence. While we were there, we met Francis. May was really friendly, immaculately turned out, and we watched as he worked very precisely, um, working on a leather belt all the time, chatting away to us and, and answering our questions. And he became our spirit guide for the next three months of engagement. No personas, just what would Francis do? <laughs> and, <laughs> seriously, and, and it helped frame a lot of the conversations amongst ourselves and with the client. We'd seen this guy embody what um, the brand was all about, and it, it, it really kind of cut through a lot of the communication. What we found surprising working with the digital designers there was how they communicated with each other. Everything was maximum fidelity. The UX designers were working in Sketch on what probably most of us would call visual design, you know, the, like that end result practically. Um, so no post-its, no sketches, no wireframes, just maximum fidelity. We found it uh, slightly uncomfortable, a bit wasteful. It certainly wasn't the fleet of foot way that we like to go about doing things. But we had to adapt to it um, because that's how they communicated um, and follow their lead in some regard. Now, partly, some of the ways that we did that was sort of hack together things in, um, in Axure with basically screenshots with uh, hotspots and things like that because we didn't want to spend our time doing high fidelity design, but we, we worked around it. In the end, though, um, we ended up persuading the digital design team to think like fashion designers. You know, they're the core of the business. We told them they should go up to the fourth floor of the building and see for themselves the messiness um, and the messiness of the, of the design process, as probably most of us understand it. The sketches, the rough work, the prototypes, and steal from the fashion designers who were at the core of that business. As Bruce Lee wrote in his 
um, Tao of uh, Jeet Kune Do, which is a collection of um, writings posthumously published, he said, use only that which works and take it from any place you can get it. And one of the places I've been taking from over the past year is content strategy. Um, so this is Ellen. Um, she's head of content strategy at Clearleft. I've been working closely with Ellen um, on a big project for the past 12 years. So 12 years, feels like it. 12 months. Um, <laughs> sorry, Ellen, she's not here, it's okay. Uh, when we did our project planning at, at the beginning um, and talked about what we'd learned, it was fairly clear that with Ellen leading the project, I'd have a lot to learn um, and, and to pick up on, techniques I could appropriate from an expert content strategist, um, and also how to work as an integrated UX and content strategy team. And the opposite was true. Um, Ellen felt that she was going to have a lot to learn from leading um, leading a team which had UXs essentially working for her um, and working alongside a UX designer um, as opposed to working separately or as quite was often the case, coming in after what seemed to be most of the UX work had done. Of course, content strategy is, you know, there's that, that old Venn diagram about being part of UX. But um, anyway, I'd like to share some of the learnings that I had working with Ellen over the last 12 months in terms of um, UX working closely with content strategy, just to give you an idea of where you can continuously be looking for, for new shiny things to be that magpie. Oh, incidentally, there's no evidence at all that magpies actually steal shiny things. That's just a myth. So what we were doing was working for um, Their World, which is a charity which campaigns on behalf um, of children across the world. But very simply, uh, the job entailed combining two websites and developing a coherent, achievable digital content strategy. It's very much um, a content-based site. There's little in the way of functionality beyond signing petitions and subscribing to newsletters and social sharing, that kind of stuff. Hence, being led by a content strategist. And a project split into two phases, immersion and strategy, and um, design and build, probably something fairly familiar to most of you. And looking at the list of activities we did, particularly in that first phase, some are specific to disciplines like content strategy might own the brand and the language related ones. Um, and UX might claim ownership of the information architecture and the navigational scheme. But on the whole, both disciplines have a claim over most of these, especially in that phase one. But it turns out we had different reasons and different approaches to doing the same thing. And we needed to recognize that in advance and work out, um, basically work it out between us what we were going to do at any given point or we'd be wasting our clients' precious time and money. We didn't really have the time or the budget to be running separate workshops, one for content strategy, one for UX, especially when there was so much overlap between the end result of the workshops and things like that. So we did workshop a lot with the clients. Um, that's something we do loads at, at Clear Left, and Ellen's got a lot of experience running workshops as well, so that was all going to be very comfortable for us. It's certainly true that not all content strategists um, research in such a hands-on way, but the same can probably be said of UX designers too. One workshop we did uh, was to develop user archetypes, so sort of personas which are bereft of any in-depth research or contextual inquiry. Um, First off, we did some audience identification and prioritization. Um, now, that's something that we could share amongst the disciplines, although Ellen broke the users down into different, more content-specific divisions. Her focus was on messaging, which kinds of people need what kind of messages. And that's not something I would have done, but actually it proved quite useful. One little learning we had this you may not be able to pick this out, but um, when we did our audience prioritization workshop, we were having to work remotely with the UX office, uh, sorry, the New York office up there in the top left-hand corner on that screen, um, which meant it was a bit difficult to kind of share post-its and stuff like that, and we ended up sticking them on the back of a MacBook, which is one good use for a MacBook, I guess. 
um, so that the camera could pick them up. Um, it worked surprisingly well, though it seemed quite a low-tech um, way of doing things. Obviously, there's software to do that, but we didn't have any around. Anyway, what I did in the workshop to add to it was empathy diagrams for each of the audience types that Ellen had identified with the client. And so this also gave us an idea of the user's context, having identified quite early on in the process what sort of content they might want, or at least what messaging. And so this context, this empathetic kind of context, isn't something the content strategist would necessarily have done, but they found that useful too. And will probably do something like this themselves. We got the client to put together these uh, proto-personas, user archetypes, and we like working the client hard. Um, they got really stuck in, really enthusiastic about it, because they found it really useful to think about their audience in such detail, and, and it certainly wasn't something they'd ever thought of behind, beforehand. So we created eight or so proto-personas with a familiar you know, background, activities, physical context, desires, and some specific requirements. And normally, I would have stopped at this point filling out these personas enough to know their context and be able to identify um, their general needs. But Ellen went further. She needed more specific detail. And so we created a second page on the back of these, which was all about the messaging and the brand impact. And it really actually brought that persona to life and helped us focus the priorities of what we would do for that user type. And between us, we learned some things here. So Ellen learned that gaining empathy of the context helps when developing the messaging. Um, we found out that um, knowing more about the tone of voice for each audience group was going to be useful, and what pieces of website or other content they need to have. And that stuff that would have come normally much further down the line, but here it was being brought right up front. And this all led us to creating this. We just it just fell out of um, just what we needed to do. Down the left-hand side are our audiences. Right across the top, we're about a mile in that direction, is um, all the different sorts of content, content that a site could have, a content matrix. And although this feels like a content strategist document, this is something I found myself pushing for as a UX designer. And through the persona development and stakeholder interviews and basic content inventory, we'd identified all of these different bits of content and mapped and prioritized the content um, against a prioritized list of audience types. Um, and in, it's hard to work out what I would have done differently, but I'm sure I would have done something different to this had I not been working with a content strategist. But the nice thing is, I did get to incorporate some currency-based voting here so we could prioritize the content um, and so integrating a, a little UX tool into the content strategist tool. And it was clear we needed loads of this content but it also became very clear that um, where the obvious priorities were and this, like I said, was a central controlling document for most of the decisions that happened after that. Here's another thing, differentiators. This was another of Ellen's workshops, which I found really fascinating, really useful. And we just asked the client what makes their world different from other charities. Now, I might have asked that question at some point, maybe just in a stakeholder interview. Um, but this was more structured, and we spent quite a long time with the clients trying to tease this information out of them. And it was really good insight for us to help us understand what made the organization tick. And the output, from my point of view, helps to the priorities of the pages and the navigation in particular. So I'll probably be asking these kinds of questions again. <coughs> Archetypes. This is great. I love these. I am totally stealing them and using them again. So these are not user archetypes. These are content archetypes. This is the workshop that ended up with these is about making the client think about how they want to come across. And the res results work really well from a copywriting perspective, but also on a bigger scale. By knowing that the charity sees itself as a storyteller, an advocate, and an innovator, um, we can shape the focus and the priorities of the site, as well as the communications in a more general sense. It's 
So archetypesinbranding.com is uh, where to go for some of those things. Really, really good. Vocabulary document, we did. Purpose of this, to serve as the language we use as a team to help maintain consistency, to form the foundations for the future decision making, to set a precedent for the use of terminology for the brand and also internally, and to lay the foundations for a new information architecture. Now, a vocabulary document like this is not something I would have done as a UX designer, but it was really useful having it and because it helped create one of these, which you might have seen before, a concept diagram. Um, and this wasn't something that Ellen had used before, so this was something she was picking up from me. Um, and actually, this is really just a visual version of that vocabulary, and it helped visualize the relationships across the, across the organization, and the client loved it too, because it increases the confidence that we understood them, and also helped them see the complexity they were feeling within the charity. And leads us on to user journeys. But these user journeys are supplemented by a bit of a story, and they're using the personas that we used earlier on. And so things like the news article they land on is about a project. Interested, they follow the link to the project page for more information. They see the project has a campaign and want to get behind it and click to take part. Now, that's obviously a fiction, but it's a fiction that we're using to... Um, to create these user journeys on the site to, because that's the whole premise of the site. We're not expecting people to come to a home page and follow some drop-down navigation. We want to guide them through to do the things that, on behalf of the campaign. User journey to get good old-fashioned site maps, which again feature that vocabulary that we worked out earlier on. So those user journeys are for the end users, um, the supporters of the charity. And I pride myself on remembering that someone has also got to keep producing and editing and adding and pruning the content. And often we designers just think of that end user who's coming to the website and forget about the client who's actually got to you know, edit that website. So this is part of the output from um, a workflow, content workflow workshop. And it went on for an entire wall about four times as big as this. And the client loved it because it was all about them. They got to vent all of their problems, talking about if all the different bits of work that they have to do to take some journalism done in Africa and make it suitable for it to come out onto their final website. Um, it was very rigorous, and it was a real eye-opener. Um, and ultimately, this led to a 48-page content strategy document, which was gigantic, but only because it had lots of different audiences. Here's part of a um, typical output from a UX designer at Clear Left. Um, we don't fetishize deliverables. Uh, obviously, there's a major piece of conversation that needs to go around with this. Um, but in essence, it's a page description diagram. You might be familiar with slightly tidier ones. Um, but it basically says what bits should go onto the page. Um, and rather than specifically direct the layout, it, the idea is that it, you know, it hints at a hierarchy and provides an inventory for the page. Here's the same information in a content strategy document, and it's a page table. And in it, it describes in some detail the content on that page, what it's for, who is the audience, who's responsible for it. And that bit that's boxed out, that's basically the page description diagram. Um, and it's missing a lot of info, as you can see, the rest of this page table. And that's why I like working with content strategists. They side with the clients um, on behalf of the users and provide the detail here, often overlooked by us designers. So here's what I learned about working with a content strategist. Um, if the product's content, get a content strategist from the start. They are your friends, so form a close partnership. Um, Often you can both want and can do the same thing, so you need to assign roles at the beginning of the project and also up front before any workshop you're likely to do together and look out what you can steal from their research. So one of my other passions um, is typography. And this is one of my very favorite books on the subject, Shaping Text by Jan Middendorp. And if you like type, or you have to work with it every day, which we all do, um, then 
I can't recommend this highly enough. It's a really accessible book, um, and it's kind of beautiful. And it, on one of its spreads, on choosing typefaces, um, it talks through various criteria that you might choose to choose a typeface, and it includes this one, your hidden agenda. It says, there may be a friend's font you want to use, a secret typographic infatuation. It can be part of the decision, so long as the result respects the reader. So if a typeface is wrong for the purpose, then what you're left is, sorry, if a typeface is not wrong, what you're left with is just how right it is. Um, so give that typeface a go, is what Middendorf is saying. And it's certainly something I've done in the past. And that's how we should approach our toolkit, our toolkit of um, techniques and software and so on that we're going to use. If you come across something new that piques your interest, maybe at a conference like this, maybe just in passing or in some other professional context, look for the opportunities to use that thing. If you can identify that the tool will actually be useful, but most importantly, you can assess the risks of using it, and it turns out that, well, it's going to do more good than harm, then go for it. Find a, a reason to use the tool that you want to. Um, it's just a case of how right that tool proves to be, and you'll still learn something either way. If we think back to the fluffy edges game, when you're planning a project or a piece of work, that's your chance to try and find something new to do. So for example, despite all of that talk of personas, I do have a healthy skepticism of personas. I find the act of creating them useful, um, even if they end up being based on supposition rather than actual research. But after that, I find their usefulness does diminish quite rapidly. The new kid on the block is um, to look at users not as fictionalized characters, but as people who have emotions, values, experiences, and triggers as they interact with your service. Um, so journey maps with um, added empathy, and those are currently being popularized as Waveline by Nathan Shedroff. Um, and so this stuff, this intrigues me. It's not something I've used yet, used in anger, but it's something I'm going to look for the opportunity to try and use instead of personas. Um, and see if I can engineer that opportunity to arrive in the next project. I might not be able to. It might be decide it's completely inappropriate, but I'm going to try and find a reason to use it. Now, you might be thinking you can't possibly learn everything there is to know. Um, all of those disciplines pointing in at us at the center of the world. And you'd be right. You may also be thinking, I know enough already. I can get by. I don't really need to learn all this new stuff. Um, that might be true too, for now. But of course, if you did think that, you probably wouldn't be here. Um, so maybe you're feeling stuck in a rut. Maybe you know, you know that there is more to know, but you don't know how to gain that knowledge. So Buckminster Fuller said, the majority of people do nothing about their good ideas. They never risk action. So don't panic about trying to keep up. Try stuff out. Think of what you do as designers, not as a repeatable process, but as a toolbox, a really awesome toolbox that you keep adding to all the time, one that grows as you grow, or as you grow, it grows. And each time you use a certain tool, ask yourself why you're using it, and keep your eyes open for opportunities to use new tools. Don't forget the old adage to ask for forgiveness, not permission. That said, you need trust for that to work. And trust can either be lent down or it can be earned up. And if you're leading a team, then you need to lend them trust and give them autonomy. If you're not leading a team, you need to earn trust, which you do by being dependable. And that means making your client or your boss look good, as I said earlier on. And that doesn't mean sucking up to them. It means helping them communicate the good work that you're doing. One more wise old man. Um, Peter Drucker, the uh, Austrian-American management consultant, wrote in 1952 in his book, The Practice of Management, that profit is not the primary goal of a company, but rather an essential condition for the company's continued existence and sustain sustainability. Now, some people have um, copied that and said that innovation is not the primary goal of a company, 
but an essential condition. I'd like to steal it and say that learning is an essential condition for a company's continued existence. But more than that, as people who do UX, as people who design users' experience, learning is an essential condition for our continued existence and sustainability. So that